Mike. Hey, Mike. Good morning. How you doing? I'm doing okay. I, I got a sort of a, a fish to fry here. Okay. Uh, you guys know that Chris Simon died this past week. Yes. Former tough guy. Died uh, of a self-inflicted wound of some kind or another. Uh, just another one. I mean, you might know the names Jeff Parker, Bob Prober, Gino Ojik, Derek Bugard, Steve Montador, Todd Ewan, all dead. And most of them found out that after the fact, because you can't find out before you you die, that they had CTE. Yeah. And and the American Medical Association has a journal that found that 14 to 30 percent of players in the NHL get concussions every year. And for every year they play, more than 20 percent increase uh, of the chance of getting CTE. Now, none of these are rock solid statistics or information, but there was one scientist at BU that said, that if you get enough brain bruises, which is basically what a concussion is, it rattles your brain against the inside of your skull. If you get enough of those, he said, your brain's gonna rot. But neither the NHL nor Roger Goodell from the NFL have conceded this. They say there's not enough cause and effect link. Well, there's a bunch of guys out there that are dead now that say somewhat differently. Yeah. And common sense says, do something about this. Those guys are riding high. Their teams, they're, they make billions of dollars. Each of those guys individually make tens of millions of dollars every year. All they need to do from, from my end of the thing is make sure they continue to do, to do the research, but set up some, so instead of hiring woke police, hire some health sheriffs and get some people out there that find out that Chris Simon is having trouble and he can't, he can't pay for his, his kids, um, fees. He can't find a house. He's in complete debt and disarray. This is happening far too often. And it's time for them to just say, we're going to find, we're going to protect our players, no matter what they do. We're going to find a place for them to, to live, get them health care and food, and whatever else they need. Just, I'm not talking about over the top mansions, but you got to find a way to, to, to reach out to these players and help them before we lose more of them. And there's no question in my mind that eventually we're going to find out that these bone chilling, rattling hits and, and punches to the head do cause CTE and, and we, they should do something about it. Anyway, that's off my chest. Well, Mike, on that, I mean, the issue is that the players that are active, whenever they're in a collective bargaining agreement, always throw the guys before them under the bus in pursuit of the last dollar of the deal. And it's going to take Sidney Crosby and Patrick Mahomes. And in, in, what, in what regard, Curtis, have they thrown them on the, under the bus? Be, well, because in terms of funding the actual retirements or getting support necessary for retired players or actually holding the lead accountable. You, you know what? I, I don't think the players should be accountable for that. They get compensated, yes, but the... the the guys that are running the bus here uh, are making billions and making tens of millions, and they, they shouldn't have to fund it. It should be part of the deal. You sign a contract, part of the contract should be if you're suffering from, you know, whatever dementia levels that you could find, that the league will take care of you to at least a minimal level and take care of your family because no no player, especially the guys at the, the far end of the bench, are going to make enough money if they start suffering from dementia in their 40s. They're going to have enough to make it last for the rest of their life. I, I hate saying it because I don't want mm -hmm. it because I love the game. But do you think they, they should the NHL eliminate fighting entirely? They should have eliminated it 20 years ago. When they knew some stuff like this was happening, don't, hey, listen, don't get me wrong. I, I, I love a good go. I love the vigilante justice. And, you know, fighting is not really as, as much of a culprit as you might think when it comes to the CTE stuff. It's the bone rattling hits against the wall that do it just as much as a punch to the head. But punch to the head, obviously, you can stop that by saying you can't fight. If you fight, you can't play. And that should have happened a long time ago. And, and I, you know, the owners want to protect it because they don't want to do anything to disrupt the fan base. And it's time to grow up and well, face some reality here. I think, Mike, I think the biggest issue, at least from what I see in the NFL, and I don't think people understand it, is that, like, as an athlete, you're not able to collect your pension until you're 65 years old. But as an athlete, some guys retire at 35. They're done playing at such a young age. And if they were able to maybe access that retirement fund earlier, then you might have, so like you said, you might be able to solve some of those issues of being able to 
you know, have that monthly stipend come in that you're not going to be able to touch until you're 65. And, you know, most guys might not even be making it to that. I, I wish there was a better way for them to help out athletes as soon as they're done playing where they can kind of, you know, be able to kind of tap into their retirement. There should be, and it should be obvious. And for some of these guys that don't know, we were just talking about Otani would – Five million is nothing against Okan. He's losing money like that. But there are some players that don't get the kind of advice that they need to get from a financial perspective or a social perspective. And yeah, if you can't access it, you can do. You can get it a little bit quicker in the uh, NHL. But you're right. That should be part of the plan too. Make sure that they have access to whatever they've earned in terms of pensions earlier. Mike Bruins sit this morning with the best record in the Eastern Conference, although the team that they have tonight, the Rangers, right behind them. Um, how are you feeling right this moment about this hockey team? You know, the first place in the league, and we keep, you know, can't we be happy with this team? <laughs> it's just it's just crazy. I know. I it's mean, weird. It, it kind of sneaks up on you a little bit because they have not. It feels like they haven't played well since the All-Star break. I, I think just because they've given some of those – third period leads away and haven't done as well in overtime but they do have the best record in the in the east they, right now they do and you can't fight that and and i really think we got to start giving them a chance here I, I i hope that they continue to play as well as they have in order to get the the top spot um because i'm a little worried about if they wind up playing toronto uh, i mean uh, toronto has been you know a guy they kick down the street most times they play him but you know, this guy Matthews is having one gigantic year. He's he's going to be tough to beat, and um, he's on fire right now. And they have other weapons all over the place. Nylander's a guy that can can do it. Marner. I mean, it's it's really a that scares me. But I know some of the other teams at the bottom of the heap now, and it's a it, it's really a dogfight for the last couple of wild card spots. But yeah. some of them are pretty dangerous. It's like but... a three way tie in the Central or whatever. Yeah, yeah, no. So it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see who they wind up with. But maybe the most interesting aspect of the team now, and we, we've talked about this almost on a weekly basis all year, is the goaltending situation. You know, Olmark got through the trade deadline, and all of a sudden he's relieved and he's he's refused a couple of trades, and now he's he's loose as a goose and he's playing the best hockey he's played all year long. On the other hand, the other guy that was reportedly up for a contract extension didn't get it and was hoping to be number one, probably deep in his heart. We would have hoped for Olmark to be traded, maybe for a defenseman that he could play behind. But now he faces a different set of circumstances and he's back to sort of 1A right now. I mean, I'd, I'm still more confident in, in uh, Swayman in terms of a mindset. I don't trust Olmark in last spring verified that but I, right now I can only go by what my eyes tell me and my eyes tell me that the better goaltender and hotter goaltender is Linus Olmark. So he would be your starter game one I, I of, guess the, today, of, but, of the first playoff series. But there's still there's still what three weeks left in this season? Yeah. Maybe maybe a little bit more so there's time for Swayman to get his, his act together. I mean he he's my personal favorite. If I had to pick one of the two goaltenders it would be Swayman because of his his age because of his attitude because of his disposition and and the other guy has not shown me in the playoffs and although there's not much of a window to peek through that he can get it done in, in big time games mike is there a world though that Linus or swayman play up to the level that they're playing because they have each other for swayman he doesn't have to take all the burden of being a starter because he knows that that Linus can come in at any time or that it fuels a competition between the two of them and if you separate them we could see a lesser version of either that was sort of the the talk out of buffalo i guess when omar came to boston that they were worried about his ability to to keep at a steady pace for a long time that you had to watch his minutes and and that that would give you credence to the fact that swayman being there and being able to step in would be a good thing and that might very well be it's not it's not my favorite thing i'd rather run with a hot goaltender than try to figure out who's going to have the better night omar or swayman but it, it could be that they push each other it, i i don't know how you measure that except in terms of wins and losses down the line and especially when it comes to their performances in big games, but it's a valid point. Mike, when you look at this team and the way they're playing this year, and I know, you know, you, like you said, that what their record is, top of the league, do you feel like there's a lot of kind of like leftover 
uh, frustration because I think a lot of people or fans look at this team and go, eh, they're probably going to get bounced in the first or second round. Do you think a lot of that has to do with the way things ended last year? It, ha it has to. And, and the fact that they lost such key parts to the puzzle – uh, over the summer, and nobody expected them to rebound the way they did, that Coyle would be, you know, 20-plus goals, and Zaka looks like after a little bit of a cold spell, he's back to playing very well. Those guys have filled in remarkably well, and nobody saw it, nobody saw it coming, and they get sloppy and lose leads late, as Greg mentioned, and that that's sort of a confidence killer for, for a fan or our team. Um, so there, there are holes here, and there are reasons to have skepticism. But there's also a reason, you know, they're they're at the top of the heap. There's reason for optimism, and just I'm having trouble finding it. Brad Marchand, for the, the last few games here, has been trying to get number 400 goal wise. Is that something that that hangs over you when you're when you're a player? No, I don't think he's going to worry about that. It's going to come uh, at some point or another, uh, and. Doesn't seem to me to be the type of guy that's going to hang his hat on, you know, some sort of landmark goal. It's, it's. Uh, I think he shows up to play every night. I think he works hard at it. I think he's going to, he'll, he'll, he'll reach that stature at some point or another. And I would highly doubt that he's hanging over his head. But hey, if it isn't anyway, it'd be good to get it out of the way. And I'm sure it'll be sooner rather than later. Mike, it is kind of a Jekyll and Hyde team, though. What's the biggest difference you've seen from games where they seem to be all in and games where they lose it, you know, at the end or in, in overtime? Discipline. Discipline in the defensive zone in particular, at turnovers, um, those are the things that they, when they start to falter, that raises its ugly head and, and it becomes a, a factor. And and that probably more than anything else, and I think I had mentioned that, that they're – their discipline in the defensive zone is not as good as as I'd like it to be. Um, fortunately, they have a back they have a backstop in the goaltending that that makes it, you know, easier to get by. But it's still going to be a problem when the checking gets really tougher and, and tighter, and the forecheck gets you know meaner and nastier. Um, they're going to have to play with a little more resolve and a little more structure. Mike, we've been talking about this Otani news. Just given your long career as a player, coach, GM, and hockey, what were your were you ever concerned about gambling? Is this a conversation you'd have with players? Obviously, it wasn't pervasive in its legality now as it is. But what was your? Did you ever have concerns about that, or ever talk to have, ever have to talk to players about it? You know, I, I don't think we ever did. There were some pretty hot card games in the back of the plane or bus <laughs> or whatever, but it was nothing that we really had to worry about. The guys didn't make enough money in my day to, to think they were going to blow it all. But there were times when guys got out of got in trouble uh, on the back of the bus betting, and it was it was kind of a a sore spot, a source of resentment. And you know, I think there were a couple times. I think I mentioned as a coach to to sort of chill out a little bit don't don't put somebody's uh back to the wall here financially and but sometimes the money got more serious than i would have liked it yeah uh huh guess what you can't sit at the big boy table then on the back of the plane <laughs> that's what we tell them and a lot of money come around you want to sit here you better you better have it you got till tuesday to pay day uh, well, well we'll, let's hope shohei has some uh better friends next year what was your game wiggy uh we played who ray for the boo ray Thousands of thousands of thousands upon thousands of dollars on plane rides. <laughs> 50, 60, 70,000. Really? Oh, yes. What's the most you lost? Um, The most I've lost, probably, you know, maybe somewhere between 20, 25,000 throughout a year. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And I've won some now. Wow. I've seen a $100,000 pot. You did? I, mm -hmm. I do not gamble anymore. And I learned my lesson when I was in, <laughs> and I was in high school. And I took my hundred dollars that I made from landscaping to the track. I lost ten bucks, bought a beer, bet ten more, lost ten, went home with about five bucks in my pocket for the summer's <laughs> worth of work. Never again. All right. Well, we're getting there. It's almost playoff time, mm -hmm. and we love talking to you about it. And Mike Milbury will talk to you again next week.